Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics program for this afternoon. My name is Gabriel Bright and I'm a member and are interested in joining, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. For this afternoon's event, if you would like to know more about our guests, the event itself, upcoming institute events, and more, you can download a printable program handout. The link is in the YouTube event description below. At the end of the event, we will have time for you to ask questions of our guests. Please type your question in the YouTube chat box on your screen. Please hold all questions until the end of the program. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and oftentimes difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Questions that are distracting, disrespectful, or attempt to dominate the chat will be deleted and the user will be removed. This afternoon's program is closed captioned for the hearing impaired. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stacy Olbig. Good afternoon. I would like to thank everyone for uh, joining us here this afternoon. And it is a privilege and an honor to be able to talk to you about the, the book that I have coming out soon. It is uh, unfortunately still very timely. It's about anger and politics and uh, the lack of civil discourse that is uh, going on in American and around the world, other, uh, the politics of other places as well. I am Stacy Olbig. Uh, I am currently a professor at Sam Houston State University in Texas, about an hour north of Houston. Uh, I've also spent some time teaching at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs at Missouri State University in Missouri. And so um, I have, I teach courses in introduction to American politics, uh, Texas politics, and attitudes and behavior. And the research I do focuses on political psychology attitudes and behavior. What, what is it that motivates people politically in terms of what they think and how they act? So that is kind of the center of my research and what the book is very much about. So I thought today I would kind of give you a summary of, of the book and I'll kind of hit on the high points of each chapter. So the book is called Angry Politics and it's about what I call partisan hatred and political polarization. And I studied college students for a number of different reasons that I will uh, speak to in a few minutes. Uh, part of the reason, a big part of the reason is because college students tend to be fairly apathetic and there's been a lot of effort to get them involved in politics. But what we find often is when college students become involved, it is perhaps not in traditional voting activities and electoral activities, but in more activism and engagement sort of things. So I was curious to see how this idea of partisanship was playing out among college students. So this is sort of the uh, outline of what I'll talk about today. I'll start by just uh, talking a little bit about incivility and polarization in American politics. Unfortunately, you're all probably very familiar with what's going on in the country and nothing I'm gonna tell you there is going to be new. So I open this talk like I opened the book uh, talking about the day in June of 2017, shortly after the 2016 election, when a, a man picked up his rifle, drove across the country, and opened fire on a congressional softball practice. It was a bipartisan practice. Teams, they were practicing on a field in D.C., or in Virginia, I believe, and he showed up and opened fire, injuring a number of different people. Almost immediately after the event started getting publicity, this Facebook group called Terminate the Republican Party popped up and someone posted the post that's shown here. And it's one, two, three shots are out at the old ball game, seemingly celebrating the shooting. And then shortly thereafter, we start seeing lots of reports by journalists talking about how this is surprising to many people, but in another way, it's not, it's been building. And I thought the quote here from the LA Times reporter was kind of apropos of what I was writing about and studying in this book. Talked about anger, revulsion, and horror about what was going on around the shooting, but then said, yes, we're all shocked, we're all upset, and we're all kind of sickened by this, but it seems like almost a natural, and he says, if sick, extension 
of what's been happening in our current politics. And this is what I had been talking with friends about, talking to my classes about, and having conversations about how bad this might get. And often when I would talk to people, they would say to me, it's really not that bad. For a long time, political scientists made an argument that while our representatives might be very polarized, our Congress members might be very much opposing each other and not willing to work together, but the American public, there would be a lot of overlap. So I want to play you a couple of short animated clips. The first will be about the rise of partisanship in the US House. And it's by the Business Insider, and it's kind of a really neat graphic to see how over the decades, partisan voting in the House of Representatives, the US House, has become more and more prevalent and the parties have moved further and further apart. After that, I wanna take a look at the public in general and look at some public opinion data that the Pew Institute has collected for us. So we'll start with a divided Congress. And I'll pause this um, after about a minute to give, orient you to the video a little bit more. Okay, so as this plays through the different decades, what you want to kind of keep an eye on is how far apart the blue dots and the red dots are, how they're clustered together or how much they overlap, and then the density of the gray lines. Thicker, darker, more dense lines indicate that the different dots, which represent representatives, are working together and voting together more often. They're sponsoring bills together, they're voting for each other's bills, this sort of thing. And you can probably guess the pattern of what starts to happen. The dots start to separate and the lines get thinner. Dr. Olbig, we're yes. not seeing your PowerPoint or any of your You're graphics. Not. If you could put it in slideshow mode. Uh, that's where I was. We will try it again. There we go. Are we seeing it in full screen now? Yes. Okay. Let's see Thank the you. For you. There. Perfect. Excellent. Sorry about that. over time, the representatives in the US House have started exhibiting less bipartisan cooperation. They're less willing to work with people from the other party. And within the parties, their members have become more unified. They're more likely to vote along the party line. And I think this is something we are seeing today with the ongoing nomination hearings and probably the vote on the Supreme Court justice that's coming up. Now, for many years, political scientists argued that that may be the case for what they call the political elite, those who are elected to office, but that the public in general is more moderate. 
So what I have here are a couple of graphics. The one on the left is for the general public, meaning a nice cross section of the American public aged 18 and older. And on the right are those respondents to a survey that said they were politically engaged, that they were very interested in following politics and current events. So over the years, we've got uh, data points at 1994, 99, 2004, 2011, 15, and 17. And we can see that even among the public, we start to see some polarization, especially among the politically engaged. We see that those who consider themselves Democrats tend to be moving left, and those who consider themselves Republicans seem to be moving to the right, and they are separating. But still, in the public, we can see a large overlap among the engaged and the general public. So there are people in the middle who are not consistently liberal or conservative and would be willing to work across party lines to get policies they might want. So the public seems to be a little more moderate than the elected elites, but still lots of polarization happening. It's hard to deny this anymore. So I want to remind us, however, we think this is a new problem, that this kind of fighting and hating each other across party lines is something new. But in reality, it's been with us since the beginning. It, it is, as I say in the book, as American as baseball and apple pie. It is exactly what the country was founded on. Our earliest parties and our earliest public figures made their politics very, very personal. So you could see some of the quotes here of what our, our founding fathers called each other. It's sort of incredible. Uh, if you read this stuff out of context, you might think, other than being a little more eloquent to do, than today's politicians, that this was said in the last election or in the current election. So you can see that we have always had these sort of mean-spirited politics. We just got spoiled in the post-World War II era of a nice, quiet kind of politics where partisanship was less in the forefront. The pictures on the bottom here show that even back in, in these days, in the 1800s, we actually had fist fights and bludgeonings on the floor of the US Congress. We are not yet back to that state, but it seems some days that we're awful, awful close. And this is the center of what I talk about in the book. I ask, why is it that American politics looks this way? Why has it come back to this way? like it was at the founding, why was it that way then? And I'm not alone in making these arguments. There have been a lot of researchers making these arguments for probably about a decade. The idea is that partisanship operates very much like any other social identity. It's not just a political identity, but a social one. And we wrap ourselves in these social identities and they make us very emotional and defensive about our groups whether that group be our racial group, ethnic group, religious group, income group, partisan group, or it could, could be a sports team. We see people get violent over those sorts of things as well. So our partisanship can very often act in the same way as all those other identities and create behavior that strikes out at other people. So the idea is that these social identities create an opportunity for us to categorize ourselves into in-groups and out-groups. And there are, our in-group is a group that we like and we wanna be approved by. This gives us psychological benefits, makes us feel good about ourselves, makes us feel more confident, makes us feel worthy. Some people argue there are biological and evolutionary advantages and imperatives to this as well. Some people will argue that by having in-groups and out-groups, we are able to protect ourselves from enemies and build in-group bonds that allow us to collectively survive evolutionary-wise. And so some people argue this happens and we are built, we are basically political animals. And so even though we may not be fighting for our literal lives, we feel like we are and it sparks that same reaction and defensiveness in us. Social identities, lead to what researchers will call positive affect or feelings for an in-group and negative feelings or affect toward an out-group. These sorts of feelings come through socialization very subtly early in our life and they persist throughout our lifetimes. We are socialized into them and over time we get repeated interactions with our in-group that tell us our in-group is good and better than the out-group which is bad and worse 
and less human. And so it'll motivate our behavior and our attitudes toward our in-groups and our out-groups. If I feel like my in-group has my back and likes me a lot and makes me feel good, then I'm gonna side with them, with the members of my in-group. When those members are attacked, it's as if I am being attacked. And there is some research that shows that if we scan people's brains and their partisan, their parties are attacked verbally, the defense mechanisms and the brains activate to defend themselves against the out group that's doing the attacking. So it has a very kind of visceral reaction, even though it's, it's just politics, as people say. Social identities have been shown to lead to outgroup denigration, disparagement, and even physical mistreatment, social shunning, things like this. We very frequently will see negative stereotypes, statements, people feeling just ill at being around members of a different group and taking violent actions against them. And social researchers have actually been able to trigger these mechanisms on seemingly completely arbitrary groups. We can get groups of strangers together and divide them up on two different teams, give them two different colored t-shirts, and they will start building in-group bonds and out-group hatred. It's really easy to trigger this mechanism. Some experiments have been started and they've had to be stopped because the, the effect was so strong that, that the researchers were afraid somebody was going to get hurt. So these reactions become very instinctually to us. And I think that's why they're so readily on display in politics. A couple of quotes here from a political philosopher from years ago who was studying the post-war period in Europe, the post-World War II period. And he talks about how when we start building these in-group and out-group feelings, we will come to look at the other side as criminal and inhuman and totally worthless. And we do that for several reasons, this author argues. It is partly so that we feel better about our own group and ourselves, but it's more importantly so that we don't feel bad about what we are saying and doing to the out group. That if we don't see them as fully human, we see them as not as good as us, then it makes it easier to discriminate, to say bad things about, to ignore and neglect the other side. Now, international relations and comparative politics researchers, those who study outside the US and who compare different countries have, have found these effects very prevalent when it comes to things like ethnic, religious and racial and ethnic divides in other countries. So they talk about genocides in other countries in these terms of in-groups and out-groups, disparagement and mistreatment. And there are those people who are a little afraid that even in modern democracies, we are starting to edge in to this idea that we might be willing to kill someone on the other side. And recently we've seen some evidence of this sort of thing, physical attacks across party lines. So in the book, I make an argument that contemporary interpartisan attitudes very much resemble the sort of absolute hatred for the other side that researchers internationally have seen that precedes genocidal actions toward another group. Now, I'm not arguing we're near genocide in America, but a lot of the language that's being used sounds a lot like the language that was used in many previous genocides in other countries. Now, how does partisanship fit into this? Partisanship is a social identity. We have known this for years. Researchers in the political social sciences have indicated that partisanship is a long-term psychological attachment to a party. We're socialized into it as a child. You can ask children as young as kindergarten what party they belong to and they can tell you and they're picking it up, of course, from the parents and the close family. They have no idea what it means, but it's an emotional attachment. It persists over a lifetime. It's repeatedly reinforced in a positive manner within the in-group and the out-group is seen as the other. There's even some recent evidence that shows that there might be some biological influence to partisan leanings. Now, I'm not saying that genetics determines a person's partisanship at all. However, genetics might make people more sensitive to certain things in their political context than others. So if there is some evidence that this is something that as much as we might try to resist it is gonna be really, really hard due to early childhood socialization and perhaps maybe even a little bit of, of genetic influence. Now, this sort of influence, wherever it comes from, whether it's nature, nurture, or both, 
will motivate how we act when it comes to politics and how we think about others and ourselves. Partisan polarization is in part, many researchers have shown and believe, is because of our threatened group status and inter-party competition. The idea is that the out party will be seen as subordinate and disparaged and the in party will be given loyalty and praise. The more the in party is attacked, the more people galvanize into their two sides and, bec and become even stronger and more committed group members. And that accounts for the polarization, the moving apart and the tightening of the two groups on each end. Many people have argued that partisan attitudes can operate just like ethnic attitudes. Partisan hatred can act just like ethnic hatreds, just like religious hatreds, and they can lead to the same sort of violence that could happen with regard to the other sorts of social identifications as well. And I think this can account for why we see a lot of kind of overtones of morality in our politics more and more and more these days. It's not simply that the other side when it comes to political parties is, doesn't agree with me on policies. It's that the other side is an evil group. They are horrible people who want to destroy things. They are somehow not fully human and not as evolved as the people on my side. And that therefore they don't deserve the same protections as the partisans in my in-group. It's kind of scary, but this is the sort of language that comes out frequently. And I'm reminded that there's another presidential debate tonight and we even hear that kind of language on the highest, from the highest stages in our country. Our candidates for, high, for our highest offices often speak in these tones, and that language is not lost on the general public. These were some signs that people have vandalized uh, in the current election. I, friends sent these pictures to me in just the last few days, and they said, this is the sorts of things that are going on. So you can see that when someone vandalizes a sign, it's not just that they might tear it down or they might destroy it, knock it down, something. No, instead there will be a moral statement about the character of the other candidates. And we're even starting to see much more kind of visceral life or death messages come out on some of these signs. So we can see at the signs at the top, Biden or die and the battle for the soul of the nation. The idea here is that this is not just an election. This is life and death, and that this is about the morality of the nation, the whole, the very basic soul of the nation. On the bottom, we can see more, more of the language about immorality and about uh, inhumanness on the other side. So we, we're starting to see this, this very angry language that gets beyond just which side, uh, which party has my back when it comes to policies I might want. Instead, it's moved completely into the my side is good, that side is bad, they are horrible people. If you vote for them, you're a horrible person in this sort of language. So I think, unfortunately, this book is more relevant today than it was when I started working on it five years ago. I was really, really, really hoping that when I started thinking about partisan hatred, that by the time the book hit print, it would be a little dated and people would be going, yeah, that was happening, but we're over it now. Unfortunately, I think I need to write a second volume because perhaps some of the things I said in the book might not have been strong enough. So to tell you a little bit about the research I did in the book, I started by creating a survey measure of partisan hatred. We don't have any good measures out there about how much people really hate the other side. And I think the word hate is apropos. When I started working on this project, I had many reviewers and uh, many people at the university that I was working at that I talked to this uh, about tell me that hatred was too strong and they thought I should use a word like animosity. And I said, well, I don't think animosity is strong enough. I think it's flat out hate. I think people are spitting angry at the other side. And I, that's what I wanna pick up on. So in reading what other researchers have done to talk about hatred in other domains, I found uh, several international researchers who were looking at things like religious and ethnic hatred, and they had some really interesting measures. They would ask people these sorts of questions. How much do you feel uncomfortable? How much do you feel threatened by the other side? How much do you wanna hurt the other side? Now, whether that's other side is ethnic, religious, or partisan, I believe it should work the same way. And you'll see that these researchers generally 
um, kind of consider hatreds of two sorts. One is called immediate, and these are the more visceral, physical reactions. When I am in the presence of this other group, I am physically repulsed versus the chronic sort of long-term simmering kind of socialized reactions to the other group, chronic hatred. So what I did was took these questions and instead of asking about things like the Islamic movement or other racial groups or ethnic groups, I simply asked about the other party, the other political party than the, what the respondent belonged to. So if a respondent told me that he or she was a Republican, I asked them, how do you feel about the Democratic Party? If the respondent asked me or told me the, that he or she was a Democrat, I asked, how do you feel about the Republican Party? If someone insisted that they belong to neither party and were a pure independent, I asked them how they felt about both parties, Democrats and Republicans. I was interested in seeing if independents were repulsed by both other outgroups of partisans. I studied, as I mentioned earlier, college students at the university I was teaching at at the time. It's a university of about 20,000 students, undergrads uh, in Texas. It's in East Texas. We get a good mix of students from the Houston and Dallas areas, the urban areas, but also some rural students from East Texas and Western Louisiana. So we get a nice mix of students. It was a random sample of students. I got 827 students, so keep that in mind. It's one sample at one university. This is what my sample looked like. The universe, our university, like many universities, is more heavily female than male, and my sample reflects that. I have about two thirds female and about a third male in my sample. And as you can see, we're a very racially and ethnically diverse sample of students at, at our university. We are a majority minority university, and so we get a population that is very diverse along these lines. We also uh, generally appeal to middle to lower income students, so we are not getting the kind of wealthiest class of students, in case you're curious. Now, what do they look like when it comes to partisanship? Surprisingly for some people, when I present my numbers, we actually have, we do lean a little more heavily Republican, as you might expect in a Republican state and in a Republican part of a Republican state, but we have a pretty good distribution across the partisan spectrum here. We get a good share of Democrats, a good share of Republicans, and a few that claim absolutely no allegiance to either party. In case you're wondering what the leaning Republicans and Democrats are, those are respondents who, when I asked, do you consider yourself a Democrat or a Republican? They said, really, neither one. And I said, really, if you had to choose one, what would you choose? And then they jumped one camp or the other. What we know from much research is that those leaners act a lot like we weak Republican and Democrats. So I treat them that way in this research. Now, if we look at their ideology, are they liberal or conservative? Do they consider themselves liberal or conservative? We can see a little more even split. And this split reflects the general population in the nation. It's about a third consider themselves liberal, liberal about a third conservative, and about a third somewhere right in the middle. So my, my student body looks a lot like the general public, not perfectly representative of America as a whole, but not too bad. And finally, as you might expect, since these were young people, generally aged 18 to 20, they weren't overly interested in politics. Now, keep in mind the time I took this survey. It was the spring of 2015 in the lead up to the last presidential election. So even though there was a very active primaries going on in both the Democrat and the Republican parties at the time, the students weren't that interested. About half said, yeah, maybe moderately, but a full 38, almost 38% said they were just barely interested at all. And anecdotally, I can tell you, they don't pay much attention to what was going on back then. So this would be a group of students that I didn't expect to be especially politically active and reactionary. Our student body is generally not the sorts that go out and protest, that scream, that blockade, and that do these sorts of things. They are generally kind of apathetic, not paying a lot of attention. So I really didn't expect to see a lot of anger come out of them necessarily. And sadly, I was surprised. So let's start by looking at some of these immediate hatred. I did not expect many students at all to tell me that they felt this way. I call this physical hatred because it's the physical reactions. 
I hate these people so much it makes me physically ill and I want to strike out physically at them. So when I asked Democrats about Republicans and Republicans about Democrats and independents about both parties, this is what they told me. And I was kind of surprised at this. Now, granted, the almost never category gathers the most responses on every one of these items. But still, take a look over here. About 35.5% of the people who answered this survey in private, online, with no one else watching, anonymously told me that they do sometimes feel physical reactions like muscle tension, sweating, and, and being angry like this to the point of clenching their fists, basically. Almost 35.5% tell me this. At least sometimes they feel that way when they are in presence of someone from the other party. I was surprised that about a third of the students on my campus were walking around feeling this way. The same is generally true here. Now, extreme feelings is vague. What does that mean? I'm not sure, but I know that extreme is a pretty strong word and about a third of them were willing to say that. This surprised me. How many of the, the students that responded to this survey actually wanted to have a desire to get rid of or destroy the other side? I would, I, if I'm a Democrat, I want to destroy Republicans. If I'm a Republican, I want to get rid of Democrats. Almost 16%. And I was a bit surprised by that. So one and a half of every 10 students I walk by feels this way. I, I was shocked. Same thing here. I want to get revenge. I want to be angry and, and strike out at the other side. Nearly 18%. And then much lower percentages here. But still, we're getting you know, about 11% saying, I really want to be violent against the other side. I am currently in the process of getting approval to rerun this survey with a sample of students this coming spring following the presidential election. I think that I will probably get higher numbers reporting these sorts of feelings. I hope I'm wrong, but my guess is the numbers will probably go up. Now, the second type of hatred that I look at in the book is something I call organizational hatred. And the idea is that the, that the respondents hate the other party's organization. They hate things about the institution of Democrats and Republicans, and that they would be just as happy if that party just quit existing and, and was made illegal. And so here we get much more agreement. You can see I get more than half saying that they feel like the other party has personally offended them, has kind of, kind of been mean to them in a way. More than half are also almost three, two, two thirds are reporting that the other side is just made up of bad people. They are just not good individuals. They are somehow more evil, less moral is the idea here. About a third, 30% or so, say that they feel like the other side and the leaders of the other side are out to get them just because of their party. So there's this feeling of imminent threat that they feel like they, that they are, the other side is trying to attack and destroy them. And then the idea that almost half say, yeah, I, I really, really feel negative. I feel down and angry and depressed when I think about that other party. So these numbers are quite high for a group of students that generally doesn't pay much attention at all to what's going on in the news and who is most worried about the next exam they have and the next kegger they're gonna to go to. So I was kind of surprised. The last type of partisan hatred that I took a look at was what I call interpersonal hatred. And this is the street level one-to-one -one interactions with each other kind of hatred. I asked the students how many of them would be glad to socialize with more members from the other party. More than half disagreed and said, no, I really don't want to socialize with all those people from the other side. I really don't want to be around them. When I asked them, would you be glad to even just know more of them? You don't have to socialize with them. You don't have to play with them and party with them. But, you know, do you do you want to know them? And I still get nearly half saying, no, I really don't even want to know them. So the idea is here is that students and rank and file Americans are saying, I don't want to be around these people. I don't, I don't like them and I don't want to be near them. Now, I also asked a couple of questions about sort of, is the other party bad for the nation or not? 
And I called this national hatred, but these measures just didn't perform like I thought they would. And I will come back to these at the end. I talk about them a little at the end of the book and it's somewhere I wanna go with my research in the future. So when I ask people, do you think that the, uh, the actions of the other party are just and legitimate? Two thirds said, no, they're really not. So a lot of people are saying the other side is not legitimate. And this is kind of scary to me thinking about the upcoming election. No matter who wins, the other side might be making charges of an illegitimate election. And I'm a little nervous about that and what it might mean for the stability of democracy in the nation and for potential violence following the election, no matter the outcome. And then finally, do they feel like the other side is a threat to the nation's well being? I got about 42% saying yes, they did feel that way. And I've seen some recent polling on a similar question that shows it much higher on the nationwide scale, over half of the country is willing to say the other side is not good for the country at this point. So again, if I get to rerun the survey, I expect these measures will probably, these um, percentages agreeing and disagreeing here will probably go up for the students in my sample. All right, so who is it that seems to be hating the other side the most? When it comes to these angry, wanting to strike out physically at the other side, what I found in my sample was that the college-aged men were more likely to say that they were angry in a physical sense and wanted to physically retaliate than the women were. And a lot of research would suggest this is the case, just aggression research would suggest that physical aggression rates are slightly higher among men than women, or at least admitting to them is among men than among women. So that wasn't a real surprise to me. When it came to sort of the, uh, the other kinds of characteristics and demographics, what I discovered was that there weren't many black and white differences at all. The levels were roughly the same of disliking the other side, hating the other side, but that the Latino population on my campus was less likely to report hatred of, of the other side when it came to partisanship issues. Uh, that might be in part, I think, because the Latino population we have here is less politically engaged. And so less political engagement tended to go with being less willing to hate the other side. So the politically interested, much more likely to say they hate the other side. So the downside to activating the youth vote is that they get angry and they start hating the other side, just like the grownups, as my friend calls them do. Young people, just like the older voters, get more interested, more committed, they get less ang or more angry. Stronger partisans, not surprisingly, express more hatred of the other side, as did those who expressed an ideology of any sort. Weak, moderate, or strong liberals and conservatives were more likely to report hatred of the other side than my moderates that, that said, I'm just in the middle here, which is not surprising. Those in the middle have cooler feelings they have more mixed feelings, so they're less likely to express hate in either direction. So what, where does this come from? Well, the media gets blamed a lot. And so I take a look in one of the chapters at media use and how it correlates and might be causing this hatred. The media gets blamed all the time, particularly online social media. I looked at three broad classes of media. I asked students about how much they read newspapers and news magazines, how much they listen to the radio or podcasts, and how much they pay attention to television news of any sort. And then finally, how much they look at online media. And that included online newspapers, as well as social media, like blogs or posts, things like that. Not surprisingly, my students were more likely to rely on online media. Very, very few of them actually reported regularly reading any print media, which is unfortunate because newspaper use actually correlated with lower levels of interpersonal hatred. This was true whether a person reported being a partisan or an independent. People who read newspapers tend to hold more moderate views and not hate the other side as much. Many uh, arguments are made about why this might be the case. Part of it is that when you read a, a print source, it's not as easy to isolate into an echo chamber that generally if you're reading a decent paper or online source of, of news, such as these things uh, as newspapers would give us, that you're going to run across kind of more moderate views overall and perhaps 
more mixed views, some that support one side, some that support the other. Unfortunately, newspaper use is uh, greatly on the decline with all ages, but especially with young people. When it came to television use, I found that higher television viewing, or more regular television viewing to get news about politics was correlated with more interpersonal hatred, with hating the other side as people more. So the television uh, consumption tended to uh, breed this kind of animosity in people. And television use, it's very easy to self-select into a media source that reinforces pre-existing ideas. And so there's not a lot of breaking out and tempering of attitudes. And finally, the online, especially blog use, if a person is reading blogs regularly, I saw incredibly high forms of physical and organizational, organizational hatred. And I think if we go online and we look at any re responses that we see online, we see a lot of that coming out. We see a lot of anger being posted and it takes me right back to my opening story about the congressional softball game and the comment about one, two, three shots are out. I think we see that sort of stuff more and more and more. And so I did find that the social media and the online use was particularly problematic for breeding this kind of hatred. Now, so what, what does it matter? Well, I went in a couple of chapters and investigated both the social and political consequences of this. Socially, I asked people, uh, how important is it to you to live in a place where most people share your political views? And my students told me about six, almost 62% of them agreed or strongly agreed that yes, they wanna live around people that share their political views, that they don't even want a neighbor down the road of a different view. They'd rather just hang around people like them who, who agree with them. And we can see that this holds whether the, the, they are reporting being Democrats or Republicans. My Republicans in my sample were just slightly more likely to agree and strongly agree, but a majority of my, the Democrats in my sample did as well. Moderates were the least likely to do so. Not surprisingly, those who hated more tended to report more likely wanting to be isolated from the other side. So I saw if we go from those who uh, had the least hatred to the most hatred, I saw an increase of about 80%. So if someone had the least organization, organizational hatred expressed the least, they were 80% less likely to want to not live around others. It's kind of an odd of way of saying it, but basically, the more a person hated, the more they wanted to be isolated from the other side. And this held for both the organizational and the interpersonal. So this hatred is building up a tendency to act out in a way that people are socially isolating from one another. They don't even wanna live near each other. I thought this was an interesting question and there's been a lot of research on this nationwide that finds that increasingly people will admit that they don't want an in-law from the other party. Now, my students are a little more generous than the general public. Rates in the general public are much more higher, are much higher than this. My students, only about six to 10%, depending on the partisanship expressed, say that they, they would be upset if, if a family member married someone from the other side. The uh, nationwide samples are in the double digits easily. Some, some surveys have shown as high as a quarter or more of the general public is willing to say, I don't want a an in-law of a different party. There was actually a study done a few Thanksgivings ago that showed that I uh, used cell phone tracking and determined that if people traveled to a county of a different partisanship to be with a family member at Thanksgiving, they spent about, about 20 minutes less time with their family members. So if they went and traveled to a family member that was probably from a different party. They spent less time eating Thanksgiving dinner with them, which was kind of interesting as well and supportive of what I'm seeing here. So we can see the effects are fairly large. More hatred means more unhappiness at, at marrying, uh, at, at having an, an in-law from the other side marry into the family. Some of the effects were quite large, especially among the democratic uh, subgroup in my sample. Again, we have to take these effects with a grain of salt because it's one sample and they're just predicted effects. They're not precise point estimates. But the effects are fairly large here. 
So it's a little shocking that even students who are 18 to 20 years old and not paying much attention to politics really don't want to be around people from the other party and don't want to talk to them and don't even want to have them marry into the family. Now, politically, what does this mean? A lot of people say polarization and this kind of animosity is a problem because we can't get anything done in the country. We can't come to bipartisan compromise. Going back to the polarization in Congress, the two parties can't agree on anything. So we can't solve the country's problems. I asked my students where they would, how, how much would they be willing to compromise with the other side? If the person was a Democrat, where would they put the compromise point? If they're a Republican, where would they put it? If they're an independent? And you can see that the partisans preferred compromises that greatly favored their own party more than were neutral. Independents were a bit more neutral. So a 50 point is the 50-50 split in policy. So we'll compromise, we'll both get about half. And you can see that Democrats wanted their side to get more, Republicans wanted theirs to get more. Now, on its face, there's nothing the matter with that. After all, the parties disagree about important policy issues. So we might expect that Democrats would want their side to win if they're really committed to the policies. The problem is that both sides become so entrenched that the gulf between them becomes huge. What I've got here is a couple of graphics that kind of show for different people at different levels of hatred, where do they put their compromise points? And you can see that if both sides of the partisan divide are hating the other a lot, the divide gets very, very far apart, gets very great. It's gonna be really hard to come to a compromised position if we are more than 40 points apart on a 100 point scale when it comes to making policy. And these are the sorts of things we see going on. Stalemates in Congress, we see filibusters, we see all sorts of things happening where we don't get agreement. Interestingly, my models predicted a bipartisan agreement point with just a little bit of anger in both parties hating the other institution of the other party. So if the Republican party dislikes the Democratic party, they can still come to agreement, which might suggest that some of that organizational hatred is based on real policy concerns and not completely emotional, which is more what the interpersonal hatreds might end up being. So overall, I kind of found these different kind of ideas about what makes us hate the other side. I also was invest investigated this question a little. Why is it that my students hate the people on the other side so much? And I wanted to get at this idea of, of immorality and the idea of a threat from the other side. So I wanted to see, is it the bad internal character of the other party, viewing the party that way that makes a person hate the other side, or is it this fear of being harmed by the other side that makes people defensive? And here's what I found. I'm surprised at this and I'm still trying to tease it out. I spend just a moment on, in the book on it and it's something I'm currently working on. What I found was that for Democrats, uh, that, I mean, excuse me, for Republicans, if Republicans felt that Democrats were out to harm them, then they expressed hating the other side more, the actual individual members more. But for Democrats, it, they didn't, it wasn't that they felt threatened, like the Republicans were trying to harm them that mattered. Instead, it was that Republicans are bad people, and that's why Democrats hated them. So we have the two parties responding to different cues. Republicans hate Democrats because they feel like Democrats are trying to harm them. Democrats hate Republicans because they think Republicans are bad people. So this is kind of a weird and interesting divide that's not parallel. And I'm kind of curious as to what's going on there. But I do think we see that playing out in some of the rhetoric in the campaigns as well. So at this point, I have just a few concluding remarks about how we might go forward as a nation, what we might do to solve the incivility that's out there, and if there's any hope at all for kind of tamping down the incivility. So I would, uh, I only have about three or four or five more minutes left. So I would ask that if you have questions, go ahead and post them in the YouTube chat um, and you can get them answered. Um, I believe someone will relay the questions to me and I can try to answer a few of them. 
if you like. But I want to move on and conclude with some questions about how we might move forward. And I don't want to leave, I hate leaving with gloom and doom and it's all going to hell in a handbasket and genocide is coming to the nation and that the country will burn after the next election. While one side of my brain says, yes, that's what's going to happen. The other side says, I certainly hope not. And let's, let's try to build a future that isn't that way. A friend sent me this picture the other day, and I thought it was a little encouraging. We see these signs from time to time that there is still civility out there at the street level, literally here. We see these two people who were out campaigning for their own sides, and yet they can agree. And I thought it was interesting that they're standing in the middle of the road, compromising and agreeing to disagree here. So I thought that was interesting. Now, in the last chapter of the book, I talk about a couple of different things that might allow the nation to kind of mend this divide and for the polarization to moderate and the hatred to perhaps, perhaps decrease. Social identity theory would argue that when we see each other as members of a larger group, we are more likely to get along and our internal divides are less likely to be problematic. So for instance, if Democrats and Republicans could see themselves as Americans first and then Democrats, Republicans secondly, we might get along better. We might be able to shake hands and say, we may disagree on our candidates, but we all agree that American democracy is worth it and it's where we wanna be. Now, there, that was an idea and we see this sort of thing, say after the 9-11 attacks where the partisan divide virtually disappeared and everybody was flying the American flag and not their partisan flags. And this encompassing identity of Americanism overrode everything. That is not happening these days. A lot of people said, if we get a nice big national threat, we're gonna kind of circle the wagons and get together, the two parties. And then COVID hit. And a lot of people said, oh, this is it. We're gonna rally as a nation and we're gonna close ranks and we're gonna fight COVID. But it hasn't happened. If anything, it has divided us more internally. And part of that reason, many researchers that study things like epidemics and pandemics tell us is because in an epidemic or a pandemic, your neighbor becomes your enemy potentially. It is your neighbor who might make you sick. And we saw this with the masking arguments, the anti-maskers and the maskers. I feel angry at someone who's not wearing a mask because I feel like that person is threatening me. I feel like the person wearing the mask is threatening my way of life because they're telling me to wear one. We saw these threats and these divisions in society actually get exacerbated rather than mended with the COVID pandemic. So I don't think we can rely on the COVID pandemic to bring us together. I don't think I had to tell you that. I think you're aware of that. In the last chapter, I do talk about this other thing called actively open-minded thinking. And as you might guess, only an academic could come up with this. A group of psychological researchers have been playing with this idea for quite a while now. And what they do is they have groups of partisans get together and then they have them try to come up with the best solution to a problem and that whoever comes up with the best solution the quickest, it's puzzle solving basically, they have them solve different puzzles, and those who can come up with the puzzle answer the quickest win money. They win the right to brag and they win a little bit of money in a game they're playing. And what they discover is that people will put aside their partisan attitudes and their disagreement about all sorts of things if they are motivated by winning a game together. And it's sort of interesting. And the idea these psych psychologists are finding is that it engages the rational brain more than the emotional brain. Now the emotional brain reacts faster, especially to threat than the rational brain. And so the, the trick is to get the human mind to push back that emotional reaction and let the rationality come to the forefront. And they argue that these techniques can work. So the researchers say that if we train people this way, we teach them that when you want to react and strike back, instead you take this approach where we all try to win versus I try to win, my side, that it could work. I think it's a little Pollyannish to think that we can have that happen, but it is hopeful that they are seeing progress when they teach students and adults these techniques, they find that they have lasting effects over several months, that people really do change their behavior and the way they think. 
So maybe there's something to that. Something else that I mentioned in the book is this hope that there might be elite leadership, that our political leaders might step up and become role models again for kind of building these bridges and that the polarization we see in Congress might start to ease up. Lots of congressmen, especially senators, retired because they felt like the bipartisanship had gotten so awful. And those senators were the ones who were in the middle, the bridge builders. They are now gone. So if some bridge builders could come back in politics, we might see then a trickle down effect to their followers in the parties. I have an example of this in just a second, something that's going on in Utah that is actually the first sign of perhaps some elite leadership on this. And then lastly is something I've been playing with. When I was uh, serving at the Air Force Academy the past couple of years, a political theorist and I, political philosopher and I, were sitting around talking about civil discourse. And she and I came up with this idea of trying to, in our classes, very subtly train discourse that was civil. We always did that, but we started doing it very consciously. We would teach students the difference between debate and discourse. We would talk to them about body language reactions, about engaging with the other human being, because young people these days are constantly on social media, and I'm afraid that our COVID, uh, COVID social isolation is, made, is going to make it worse for another generation. Our students don't know how to interact. Our young people don't know how to actually go out and engage in conversations with other people. And so we wanted to kind of get them in the habit of doing that. And we found we had some success and I can talk a little bit about what we did there and how it worked and kind of where we're headed next in that if you're interested. But let me get back to this elite leadership idea. Now, these two guys are running to be the governor of Utah and they created this ad recently and it's been playing and it's gone viral. It's starting to make the rounds around the nation. Some of you may have seen it. And I thought it was kind of an interesting approach. Now, the question will be, is it more than lip service and do others pick up on it? So they're running to be governor and they put out this joint ad in the days leading up to the election. I'm Chris Peterson and I'm Spencer Cox. We are currently in the final days of campaigning against each other to be your next governor. And while I think you should vote for me, yeah, but really you should vote for me, there are some things we both agree on. We can debate issues without degrading each other's character. We can disagree without hating each other. And win or lose in Utah, we work together. So let's show the country that there's a better way. My name's Chris Peterson. And I'm Spencer Cox. And we, we approve, approve this message. message. So the hashtag stand united is what they're trying to get to catch on. And they've been encouraging other politicians from around the country to follow their lead and start doing these things. And perhaps they think if we do this, send the signal that we can start to build, rebuild some civility in our politics and at least some talking across party lines. We don't have to love each other. We just have to work together is kind of their message. The last thing I have here, and I'm not gonna play this whole video, but I would encourage you to, to Google it. It's a Heineken ad, Heineken beer made an ad, and they go through uh, five different stages in this ad. It's a five minute commercial, so I won't play it. I'm, I'm anxious to get to your questions. Uh, and if we want to watch this ad later, we can. But the idea is they bring two strangers together. They have them do a little icebreaker where they simply introduce themselves and then they have them ask five questions of one another, simple little questions, describe yourself in five adjectives, where are you from, where did you grow up, those sorts of things. They have them do what they call bridge building, which is where they have to perform a task together. They have to work together to accomplish something. In the commercial, what they have them accomplish is put together uh, a puzzle out of big boxes. They have to unpack boxes and put together furniture, which turns out to be a bar that you sit at. And then they have them go put st stools together and pull up the stools to the bar. Then they have them watch video, a short video clip of the other person explaining who that person is and what they stand for politically. And what we find out at that stage is that they've paired up people. They've paired up a strong feminist with a, a, a gentleman who thinks that is very much anti-feminist views. They pair up a transgender person with someone who's against transgender identities. 
and they have them then reveal themselves to each other through these clips. Number four, the decision is when they ask them if they would like to sit down and have a beer together and talk about their differences. And they have to decide, will they go over to the bar they've built and open their Heineken and have a conversation? And in the end, some of them decide to have the conversation and some of them don't. And so the ad, the idea of the ad is we have these opportunities to sit down as human beings and talk to one another, no matter what our politics are. And we can actually, if we see each other as human beings first, rather than partisans, this might be able to happen. Interestingly to me, this ad was not for the American market. It was for the British market, for the UK market. And they didn't even play it here. It just caught on online. And it's not played on the air here, I don't think, at all. So I found it interesting that a problem that we see as uniquely American is not. It's happening around the world. And Heineken actually plays this in their European markets. So again, um, sorry about that. I didn't mean to play the ad. So that's kind of what I've done in the book. And I can answer any questions you have. Um, go loop back around to any parts and talk a little bit more if you want. Um, I'm sorry it went so long. Sorry it, it uh, drags a little. I get very excited talking about this stuff, uh, even though it's kind of a sad topic to talk about. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and take some questions. Okay, so I'm being text questions, so I'm going to try to read them out and then I'll try to answer them. Uh, I've got Someone asking, I'm of the opinion that hate in politics evolves from the top down. It's fear mongering, but lately leadership creates hate based on the motivation of their base. So which is stronger, top down or bottom up? That's actually a very, very good question. And one I talk about in the book uh, that there are arguments both ways and there's no doubt that it's a feedback mechanism, that it goes both from the top down, but then there's a feedback from the bottom up as well. So what we see is elite signaling and trying to get their ranks in order and rally the base. We hear this a lot, right? Rally the base, get out the boat in the base, uh, charge up the base and nothing charges up a, a base as, as well as emotion and anger and, and desire to win and destroy the other side. So we do see a lot of that, but I don't know that we can completely blame it on the elites, on our politicians. Uh, let's face it, the politicians wouldn't be elected if the public didn't like it. And a lot of the politicians who were in the middle of the polarization diagram that I had shown you in the beginning, the voters voted them out of office because they were seen as centrists. They were seen as not loyal to the party, as selling out to the other side. And so I think that is part of what's going on as well. And I believe in the book, I argue this, that it's especially true when we start seeing partisanship line up with other social characteristics like religion and sex and race and ethnicity. So when all of our social identities split along the same line, when it becomes, if I'm a Democrat, then I'm probably also young and poorer and a woman and a racial minority. When we start seeing all of those identities line up, then we see the rank and file grassroots kind of splits develop and strengthen even more. And smart politicians will then take advantage of that. They will try to appeal to the masses. They're going to sell them a message that they want to hear. And it works. Uh, in the middle, I think you have to keep an eye on the, the, uh, the rank and file voters who are at the conventions. So the delegates to the conventions that nominate the presidential candidates, for instance, and the voters who vote in the party primaries. They are more polarized than the general public. And so if they are picking the politicians, they're gonna pick politicians that are more extreme and offer them to the general public who's then gonna polarize as well. So there's all sorts of feedback mechanisms going on in there as uh, top to bottom and bottom to top um, where the solution could, should come from. I think we attack it at both places from the top and from the bottom. And that's why I was interested in the uh, civil discourse training from the bottom up kind of inculcating skills in younger voters as they come of age in the political electorate, and then also elite leadership down, signaling these sorts of things. All right, another question. Many people I know to be liberal have expressed that conservative beliefs are directly harmful to both them personally and to the nation as a whole. For example, oppressing a certain group, quote, 
If they believe this, that means they're out to get me, end quote. Is it common for people to hate the other side's beliefs and their supporters, creating a buffer between the people and the party itself? So I would say your question is, is it common for people to hate the other side's beliefs and their supporters? I think that uh, what I showed you here today is it's more common than we might hope that at, even in my sample of young voters who weren't very engaged, a third to, to a half and sometimes two thirds do, in, do indeed uh, have the emotions and the reactions that, that you point out here, um, that if the other side believes this, it means that they're, they're out to get my side. I think that is more common than we think, and it's become increasingly common since 2015 when I collected my data. And as far as does it create a buffer between the people and the party, I'm not clear I understand the question fully, uh, but if you're asking, do basically is the party not representing the people well, or are the people not getting what they want out of their party? I, I'm not sure that's the case. I think that people may be getting to some degree what they want out of a party. They want to see the party attacking the other side. They want to see the party defend their side, them as individuals. They, now, I will say that those in the middle, the independents and the moderates were disgusted with both sides and that they are more likely to simply say, I want a third party or I want these two parties to grow up and start acting like adults. The problem we have is that we live in a two party system. We have two major parties, third parties just aren't viable for a number of institutional reasons. And so the two main parties keep picking candidates who are more extreme. So those in the middle don't like either one and the reaction is very often simply to drop out, to not vote. When people ask me about the, the debates, the presidential and vice presidential debates and how much they were gonna matter, I would tell them, I don't think they're gonna matter a bit. I think what they will do is perhaps, to your point, rally the bases a little more and make them more loyal to their parties. But for the most part, people know how they're voting right now. They know which side they're gonna vote for and those who know they're not gonna vote, know they're not gonna vote. And so people have made up their minds. And we know from the research that people make up their minds before the candidates are picked. You know somebody's party, you know how they're probably gonna vote. And so the parties are giving the public what they want to some degree. And I think that's problematic. The question is, is there a market for less extreme politics? And we see the guys from Utah giving it a shot. We'll see if it catches on. Another question, uh, many people I know uh, Oh, wait, I just read that one. Uh, what future research do I want to do uh, related to this? I've actually started a few things. One is what I showed you with the trying to figure out why we hate interpersonally, what it is. Why is it that we can like see another person and actually hate that person enough to bash them on the head, to pull out a gun, to set their shop on fire? Why do we do these sorts of things? And so I really am interested in kind of what pushes people over the line from screaming and yelling to violence, to doing harm. And I'm curious to know just how much people are willing to sacrifice of American democracy in order to get revenge on the other side. So if I am angry enough at the other side, the other partisans, that I, want, I will say that's an illegitimate like, election. I would rather we not have elections ever again as long as that side doesn't win. I wonder if people are feeling that way. Are they willing to give up some of the fundamental characteristics of our system, of our governmental system, in order just to eliminate the other side from ever winning? I worry that, that this may be the case, that some people may be saying, we heard these, these um, kind of comments come up, that maybe we shouldn't be having an election in the midst of a pandemic. Maybe we should just postpone the fall election, the presidential election. Those sorts of statements frighten me a little because at its base, our, our democracy is sort of based on our, our constitutional guidelines. And if we can't kind of play by the rules of the game we've established for ourselves, where are we headed? Now, I'm not saying that tomorrow democracy ends in America, but I do wonder just how serious people are about sacrificing. I might have to lose in order for our democracy to continue and I might have to lose for a decade or more. That used to be the case that parties were willing to say, 
okay, I just didn't come out, out on top this time, I'll fight a better fight next time. But I sometimes wonder these days how many people say, I didn't come out on top and it's because the system is completely stacked against me and needs to be destroyed. Now, no doubt, there are parts of the system that need to be reformed potentially and, and could show some great gains if they're reformed. But I do wonder how many people are willing to say, let's scrap it and start over. Let's just try again from scratch. And those are the sorts of things that have me wondering. So I kind of have different interests. Uh, empirically, I've already told you, I would like to go back and resurvey my students at my university, as well as students at other types of universities across the nation and kind of get a feel for where the current young people are. We've seen the uh, protests in the streets. We've seen a lot of political activism, a lot of party activity on the part of 20 somethings. And so I would love to know kind of how they are thinking and acting right now. Um, I'm teaching this semester, but almost all of my teaching is online. So I don't get to sit in a classroom with my students. I don't get to go sit in the dining hall and chat with them like I used to and get to hear them say things. The restaurants and bars aren't open, so I can't overhear their conversations. So I really kind of don't have my, my in with them right now. And I'm very curious about what they're thinking. Um, on top of that, I have a couple of other friends that we are working on the civil discourse idea. How can we build into our courses? If people are gonna go to school, both high school and to college, shouldn't they be learning to engage on a human level with other people? And shouldn't they be learning that even though we don't agree on everything, we still should respect one another and that you are a human and you're as human as I am. And so we ought to treat each other that way. And so that's part of what uh, I've been working on as well. And beyond that, I've been looking a lot at party legitimacy and this idea of when people in the country might consider a political party illegitimate and if they would be willing to pass a law to outlaw another party. So would Democrats be willing to pass a law that said being a Republican is illegal and vice versa and punishable? So I'm curious about that, just kind of how far along the, the pushing out and annihilating are we institutionally? So if that makes sense, I know it's a lot of academic jargon, but that's kind of where my, my mind is these days. I think that's about um, all the questions that have come in. I appreciate you putting up with me today and giving it a listen. And I, I hope that um, it was interesting enough to you. And I encourage you that if you would like, um, drop me an email. Uh, I can provide it and we can put it in the description of YouTube. It's simply my last name, Olbig, U-L-B-I-G, at S-H-S-U, Sam Houston State. And I would remind you that if you care to get a copy of the book, um, it will be on sale shortly. I believe it goes uh, November is when it's supposed to hit print. And there will be a link for it also in the YouTube. So if you're interested in that. But I, I love having these conversations and hearing what people have to say, even if you think I'm wrong and full of it. I love, I love people telling me that. I like to, to hear what's on your mind. So let me know. And again, I thank you very much uh, for having me this afternoon. And I will turn it back over to our hosts. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for our program this afternoon. If you are a student and would like to join the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Join us on Tuesday next week for a conversation with America's foremost political prognosticator, Charlie Cook, where he will join us for an evening of campaign discussion. You can access this program on the Dole Institute's YouTube channel, just like today's program. Refer to doleinstitute.org for up-to-date information on all of our upcoming programs. If you enjoyed today's program, please consider becoming a friend of the Dole Institute by donating to help make programs like this possible. We hope you enjoyed this afternoon's program. Thank you, and we will virtually see you next time.